Our scripture passage for this morning is found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 7 through 11. But to each one of us, grace has been given, as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all of the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. By the end of next week, you will all have spent a lot of time on gifts. Shopping, choosing, buying, hiding, wrapping, perhaps transporting, and of course, opening presents consumes much of our time during this hectic month of December. I think perhaps too much emphasis is put on gifts, but I can't deny that gift giving and receiving is important to all of us, especially at Christmas. Now face it, we all love to give and to receive gifts. There's something special about receiving something that was carefully selected just for you by someone that you love and who loves you. Gifts express love, and they indicate a great deal about the person who gives the gifts, as well as the one who receives them. Now, it's certainly appropriate to give and exchange gifts at Christmas time, because the greatest gift that was ever given was the event that we commemorate at Christmas in the form of a human baby who brought life to the world. What a wonderful gift was given to us. And gifts were brought to him as an expression of love and worship. And how appropriate it is for us to exchange gifts at Christmas time. God is in the gift giving business, and not just on special occasions, but every day. He takes great thought and care into the gifts that he presents to to every child. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. That means that every good thing you have comes from God. Every one of those perfect things that you have is a gift from him. Your health, if you have it, it's a gift from God. Your safety, your home, if you have one, that's a gift from God. Your job, if you have one. Your children, if you have any. Your spouse, if you have one. They're gifts from God. Your parents, if you still have them. Your church, if you have one. You all have one. (laughs) It's a gift from God. Your friends, your income, even the ability to get out of bed in the morning is a gift from God. The next breath that you take is a gift from God. John the Baptist said in John 3, 27, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Jesus said in Luke eleven nine, 9, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. And we see from creation's first family that giving has always been a form of worship for God's people. So God gives gifts to us, and he wants us to give gifts to him. God's greatest gift, of course, is salvation. The most familiar verse in the Bible. People don't know anything else about the Bible. Know John 3, 16. This is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So in our passage for today, the theme is all about gifts, not the gift of salvation, but the gifts that come with your salvation, which we often call spiritual gifts. Because there was Christmas, there is salvation. And when there's salvation, there is a special presentation of gifts. So we're going to investigate and to review three vital truths about the gifts that God gives to save people. Now, many of you are familiar with this concept, but I think it's important for us to review them, especially since we're in this gift mentality at Christmas time. The three truths are these. One, every believer has spiritual gifts. Two, every spiritual gift is from Jesus. And three, every church is gifted with spiritual leaders. All right, so let's take them apart. First one, every believer has spiritual gifts. As we see in, in verse 7. Uh, immediately in this chapter, Paul moves from the whole concept of talking about unity that he was talking in the first part of that chapter, the unity in the body of Christ, to the diversity in the body of Christ. Verse 7 says, to each one of us, to, to every believer, 
grace was given. That grace, of course, is our salvation, God's greatest gift. As we look back at chapter 2, verse 8, we understand that uh, it's by grace we have been saved through, through faith and, and not of ourselves. You know, it, it, it's the gift of God. That's an important verse uh, in verse uh, 8 of chapter 2. So sal salvation is God's undeserved favor. It's, it's the gift of God. And every believer is unified in this grace. Uh, verses 4 and 5 of our passage in Ephesians 4 teach us about the, this unity. It says that there, there's one body. Get that verse up there. Uh, next one. <laughs> okay, there you go. There's one body. There's one spirit. There, there's one hope. There's one Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all. And then notice in, in verse 6 that the Father is above all and through all and in all. Now, the word all is used four different times there. This is what all believers have in common. This is what the, the unity of the faith is all about. But then we see the difference in verse 7 when it says not about all, but to each one. He's now moving from what all Christians have in common to how they differ from one another. So we learn in that that our unity does not mean uniformity. It means that everybody's not the same. Everybody doesn't always agree on everything. We have different ways of looking at things, and we have different gifts that we've been given. God loves his people as a whole. He loves all, but he also loves people as individuals. He loves each. He's not only concerned about the unity of the body, but he's also concerned about the unique giftedness that is within the body of Christ. And so to our Heavenly Father, every one of us is indeed special and unique. Each one of us as individuals have received God's grace and salvation. That what makes us unified. Um, in the, the Greek New Testament, there's a definite article there. It should literally the grace that has been given to you. This grace has been given to us as individuals and to as a body. And yet it is by that same grace that we received the, the measure of Christ's gift or, or as, as a portion to us. Or in other words, our spiritual gifts. So in other words, we're saved by grace and we are gifted by grace. Spiritual gifts are those special abilities for the service of the Lord that you received when you accepted Jesus. And as the Holy Spirit moved into your life, he brought with him gifts for you to use in ministry. Warren Wiersbe defines a spiritual gift as a God-given ability to serve God and other Christians in such a way that Christ is glorified and believers are edified. Now, we usually call these gifts the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but it's just as accurate to view them as coming from each part of the Trinity. Now, First Corinthians seems to emphasize the role of the Spirit, but here in Ephesians, we are to view these gifts as coming from Christ himself. And the point is, is they don't come from anybody but God. They're not given by the church. They're not given upon graduation from seminary or, or Bible college. They're not handed down to you from your mother and father. They cannot be purchased or earned. Spiritual gifts are not human talents or, or natural abilities. God has given us each natural talents and abilities. People are, are gifted and, and talented in, in music or art or engineering or mechanics or academics. We might say that we just have a knack for something. You know, these are our natural gifts that come to us by our birth. But spiritual gifts are abilities that we didn't have before and that we can use for the kingdom. They come to us through the new birth. Now, there are different lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. And since they're not identical, I think we can only assume that they're not exhaustive lists. And not all the gifts are even named. Some of these gifts we learn are ministering gifts that, that build up and minister to the body of Christ. Others are serving gifts that are used to, to help others. Others are what we call sign gifts that are given at a specific time to authenticate the gospel. Now, the Lord can use our natural abilities and our spiritual gifts in his service. Uh, a person may sing a beautiful song in worship. He has, he has that natural ability to sing well. He's using that natural ability to sing. But he's also could very well be using his spiritual gift of serving or to encourage or to help others in their worship. So talent alone is, is not enough, and it's not even all that important. This poem by Alice Bennett compares the difference. I have no voice for singing. I cannot make a speech. I have no gift for music. I know I cannot teach. 
I am no good at leading. I cannot organize. And anything I write would never win a prize. But at roll call at meetings, I always answer here. While others are performing, I lend a listening ear. After the program's over, I praise its every part. My words are not to flatter, I mean it from the heart. It seems my only talent is neither big nor rare, just to listen and encourage and to fill a vacant chair. But all the gifted people could not so brightly shine, were it not for those who use a talent such as mine. Every believer has a gift, whether it might seem like it's not as significant as somebody else's. You have a gift and we are called to use it. There's no such thing as an ungifted believer. You have at least one spiritual gift. And so we discover and we develop our spiritual gifts by ministering with and to other Christians. In my first church in Wyoming, there was a man named Don Chapman who was the head usher. Don was mentally handicapped and had only a childlike understanding of life and of, of spiritual things, and that he loved to come to church. He wasn't able to serve on boards or participate in committees or things like that. But over a period of time, the people of the church had taught him the responsibilities of ushering. Now, by the time I got there, Don had the full responsibilities of being sure that everyone had bulletins and everyone had a place to sit and that the offering was properly collected and, and given to the treasure. And Don delighted in that job. And he did it professionally. It wasn't just a matter of letting the retarded guy do something. It was so much more than that. It was a job that we knew would be taken care of every week and it would be done well. But more than that, everyone who entered that church was greeted by a, a huge friendly grin and was made to feel special by Don. Don didn't know anything about church politics or about who didn't get along with who. He was just happy to be in church and he could be depended upon to lift everyone's spirit. His spiritual gift wasn't of ushering. I don't think that's on any of the lists, but his spiritual gift was in serving and it was in edifying others. Every believer has a spiritual gift. But next, we need to understand that every spiritual gift comes from Jesus. As we look at verse 8, it says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. Paul makes the point of spiritual gifts coming from Christ himself. And by using an Old Testament comparison, uh, verse 8 is a reference to Psalm 68, 18. I love it when the New Testament goes to the Old Testament to verify itself. It's great. And this teaches us how Jesus earned the right to give believers spiritual gifts. Psalm 68 is a hymn of triumph. It goes back, it says, when you ascended on high, you led captives in your train. You received gifts from men, even from the rebellious, that you, O Lord God, might dwell there. Uh, it's a, a hymn about David praising God as he ascends up to Mount Zion. And this was pictured in David's celebration of returning the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. When an Israelite king was victorious in battle, he would lead a grand parade through the streets of Jerusalem. That's what the train was. But was asking me, what is a train there? I didn't know they had trains back then. That's what it's all about. In the parade would be those who had been taken prisoner sometimes. And it was a public demonstration that the battle had been won. Also, the victor would also all often bring spoils of war to share with the people and give gifts to people. And so Paul compares this to what Jesus had done. Verse 9 tells us that Jesus ascended after he had first descended. This pictures him as that triumphant king of glory, returning from defeating the forces of hell on earth, carrying with him the trophies of his victory. And that scene is foreshadowed for us in Psalm 24, verse 7. It says, lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Second verse, same as the first. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Through his perfect life, through his sacrificial death, through his victorious resurrection, Jesus conquered Satan and sin and death. And then he led captivity captive. That which previously held us captive has now been conquered. And so upon returning to heaven, ascending again, Jesus, the conquering king, gave gifts to men. After Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to indwell the hearts of men. And when the spirit came, the gift of the spirit also came, or, or our spiritual gifts. 
that phrase descended into the, the lower regions or to the lower parts of the earth is seen in contrast to the fact that Jesus ascended far above the heavens. He then condescended to the womb, to the manger, to earth, to the grave, and even to the pits of darkness. And for this, God has highly exalted him and he has ascended again. Well, the point is, is because of Jesus humbling himself in our behalf, he has been exalted above the heavens. And he now has the authority to give gifts to men. He's earned the right to rule over his people and to gift his people that he might fill all things. So our spiritual gifts are the spoils of the victory that Christ has won on our behalf. And so under, it's important to understand that our gifts come from Jesus himself. And then thirdly, it's also important to understand that every church is gifted with spiritual leaders. Verse 11 says, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Jesus not only gifts each individual believer, but also he gives gifts to his combined body. To each believer, he gives divine abilities. And to each church in general, he gives gifted people to be leaders. The gifts that are listed here in Ephesians all seem to be in relation to leadership positions in the church. Now, that certainly doesn't mean that everybody's supposed to be a leader in the church. In fact, that's the problem with a lot of churches. There are too many leaders with not enough followers. But the point here is that every church is gifted with spiritual leaders. If a church feels that it doesn't have enough leaders, it's not because God didn't provide the necessary gifts. It's only because people might not be using them. We see four of these leadership gifts listed here. First of all, there were apostles. Uh, the word apostle literally means one who is sent with a commission. Now, Jesus had many disciples, um, but he selected 12 to be apostles. Uh, a disciple is just anyone who was a learner or a follower, a student of a teacher. But an apostle was a, a special term. It was a, a divinely appointed messenger or representative. The apostles had to have been taught personally by the Lord and be witnesses of his resurrection. The Bible tells us in several places that's what qualified someone to be an apostle. And Paul was qualified to be an apostle, even though he wasn't one of the disciples, but he did witness the resurrected Lord and he was personally instructed by him. And so that is why he could be called an apostle. Their teaching from the Lord then became the foundation upon which the church is built. Ephesians 2.20 makes a very important point of, of, of understanding that, that what we do here is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. There was no succession of apostles, and therefore there are no apostles today. In fact, we don't even find the word in the Bible after Acts uh, chapter 16. There's no record of any of them being replaced. Once they laid that foundation upon which the church is built, they fulfilled their task. And how we thank God for the ministry of the apostles. Now, you might hear sometimes missionaries who are commissioned and they're sent to a certain place to, to plant churches might be said to be modern day apostles. And, you know, that's, it's not inaccurate to say that, but, but not in the truest sense of the, the biblical word. The same can be said of prophets. Prophets were not necessarily those who foretold the future, how we usually think of them. The prophets are those who told forth the truths of the word of God. Uh, during the time before the completion of the New Testament, they were second only in importance to the apostles. They sometimes would give direct revelation from God, or sometimes they just expounded on revelation that was already given. And though they were similar to the apostles, it seems that their ministry was more local, and uh, the ministry of the apostles was, was more broad-ranging. And again, the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. But once that foundation was laid, their ministry was finished. Now, preachers and Bible teachers today, or anyone who proclaims and interprets the word of God, could also be said to be modern-day prophets. They might be called that, and that's not totally inaccurate, again, fulfilling the work of Christ's church. But again, it's not, not the truest sense of the biblical word prophet. The apostles and the prophets were the ones who laid the foundation for the church, as we read there in chapter 2, verse 20. And so upon that foundation, there now need to be modern-day leaders who will build on what those ancient leaders had established. And so more leadership positions are identified for the church in which particular gifts are needed to do the job. For instance, next there are evangelists. 
that word evangelist comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good news. An evangelist is one who was especially gifted at sharing the good news of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is an ongoing gift, a gift that is needed today in the church. There are many people alive today, perhaps some of you right in this room, who are gifted in evangelism. Some evangelists speak to large audiences like Billy Graham or Louis Palau or others like them. But most evangelists are not famous. Most evangelists are ones who evangelize one-on-one. -on -one. We might not even call them evangelists, but, but we see them at work when we see someone get saved. And then we also see family members and acquaintances and coworkers and neighbors coming to the Lord. You better believe that person is a gifted evangelist. Well, how do we know who an evangelist is? Well, we see people who have that special ability just to make the gospel simple. That was the wonderful thing about Billy Graham. I mean, his preaching wasn't really all that more profound or, or, or deep than any other preacher I've heard. There's just something about the way he presented it and made it simple that people responded to it and they were led to the Lord through it. Evangelists are gifted to, to probe the heart, to, to answer objections, and to encourage people to accept Christ. And some are especially gifted evangelists. But even though that's the case, all believers are called to do the work of an evangelist. 2 Timothy 4.5 specifically tells us that we are to do the work of an evangelist. All believers are to evangelize, but it's just that some believers are especially gifted as evangelists. And so you're not off the hook. You need to share the gospel anyway with anybody that you can. Don't say that it's just not your gift. That's too easy of a cop out. I am praying that God will raise up a number of evangelists here in our church, men and women who will bring people in so that they can be taught and discipled. All right, next then there are pastors and teachers. Now, they seem to be going together rather than saying some pastors and some teachers. It's some pastors and teachers. Um, a pastor is a teacher, and a teacher is a pastor in many ways. Uh, the word pastor is another word for shepherd. Uh, the local church is like the flock of God. Paul told the Ephesian pastors in Acts 20, 28, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. Watch over the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. First Peter 5, 2 says, be shepherds of God's flock, which are under your care. Now, I'm called to be um, the pastor of this church because it is my chosen vocation. It's my job for which I get paid and uh, how I make my living. I do it because I felt called by God to use my spiritual gifts in that way. But even if I weren't the hired pastor, I would still be called to use my gifts in the local church to help shepherd the flock. And in the same way, there are others of you who are gifted to be pastor slash teacher, even if it's not your vocation. And I see you at work in many ways doing the, the, this work, the spiritual work. There are two other terms given in the New Testament which are equivalent to pastor. And the first word is the word episkopos, which is often translated in the Bible as bishop or overseer, that, that's what it literally means. Epi is over, and skapos means to see. So the, the bishop is the overseer uh, or the guardian. This refers to the pastor's management or leadership or oversight of the local body. The other term is elder from the word presbyteros, or the Presbyterians get their name. It's basically referred to someone who was um, to be respected, often someone who was aged. This title also suggests someone who was tender and gentle, one who can not only defend the sheep from predators, but also lovingly care for them. Sheep can only be healthy when they're fed, and a church can only be so strong when she is fed. Thus, pastors are also to be teachers so that they can feed the people of God with the word of God. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Now, there are many, many other spiritual gifts that are not listed in this passage in Ephesians. But as I mentioned, 1 Corinthians has a good list of it. Um, Romans 12 has a, a big list of gifts. Um, 1 Peter 4 also talks about spiritual gifts. And we could do a lengthy study on spiritual gifts. I hope that everyone here who was a believer in Jesus Christ has realized that you have been gifted in some way to do God's work. We need everybody using their individual gifts. For the, for the body of Christ to be whole and to be functioning. 
But the main thrust of this passage has to be in context with, with the whole book of Ephesians. I know ladies have been studying Ephesians, women's retreat was on Ephesians. It's what an important book. The first three chapters have to do with who we are in Christ and realizing what a difference that makes. And the last chapters talk about what we do with that, how we act. And using our gifts is, is what we do with our identity as Christians. And the fact is that God has gifted some of you, but not all of you, to be leaders in the church, to evangelize, to teach, and to shepherd others. Many of you have already been doing that. How thankful I am for the gifted leadership that we have in this church. But I'm sure that God desires to raise up more of you to be leaders in his church. And all of you need to be using your gifts because every Christian has at least one. Some of you might need to take on more of a leadership role, not, not because you're better than anybody else, because you're so talented or smart, but because God has given you the gifts to do so. He loves his church, and he gives us just what he knows that we need. Others, you, others of you have gifts that are mentioned elsewhere in Scripture that are to be in support of church leadership, gifts that are just as important and just as needed, gifts like encouragement and hospitality and, and serving and caring and, and a host of others. Use your gifts. And if you don't know what they are, then you can only find out by giving of yourself and seeing what God does with what you give. Just as you receive God's gift of salvation when you ask Jesus into your heart, reach out and receive the spiritual gift or gifts that God wants to give to you and get ready to use them and to bring glory back to God and honor back to Jesus. If you have not received Jesus Christ into your life, we got a great Christmas present for you this year. <laughs> Reach out and take it. It's yours. And there are many, many more gifts to come. 